Heritage Lecture Series. My name is John Carlton and I'm the organizer of the Frankfurt Heritage Week Coalition that has put on Frankfurt Heritage Week annually since 2021. I'm extremely grateful to one of our partners, Paul Sawyer Public Library, specifically Community Services Librarian Diane Dahoney for enthusiastically agreeing to be our host for this series. I am also grateful to another one of our partners, the Frankfurt Plant Board and Cable 10 for taping and broadcasting these lectures. Many of you may know, may not know that there have been several other lecture series in the past from former mayor and Frankfurt historian Frank Sauer, who, like Russ Hatter, gave many talks and tours around Frankfurt and was an inspiration to people like John Gray, Russ Hatter, Nikki Hughes, Gene Birch, Richard Taylor, Chuck Bogart, Jim Wallace, and others with the support of the Kentucky Historical Society and Kentucky Heritage Council to begin the historic Frankfurt lecture series in the 1980s which thankfully were recorded and have been preserved for future generations by Cable 10. I've been working since 2021 with Cable 10 to digitize those lectures as time allows, and some of them can already be found on Cable 10's YouTube, ch YouTube channel for your year-round enjoyment. The historic Frankfurt Lecture Series largely started the first modern academic research and gathering of information about Frankfurt's and Franklin County's rich history. It inspired the first detailed look at Frankfurt's African-American history with lectures on Frankfurt's African-American churches, the Craw, the Civil War, and the devastating impact of urban renewal. It was the catalyst for the publication of the first comprehensive book on Frankfurt and Franklin County's 200-year history, Capital on the Kentucky by Carl E. Kramer, which was published by Historic Frankfurt and sponsored by Farmers Bank and Capital Trust Company. That was followed by other books by Historic Frankfurt and others, such as Historic Frankfurt Yesterday and Today, Volumes 1 and 2 of Historic Images of Frankfurt, A Walking Tour of Historic Frankfurt, Portraits of Early Families, Frankfurt Area Before 1860s, Community Memories, A Glimpse of African American Life in Frankfurt, uh, and the 2018 Thomas D. Clark Medallion Award winner, Richard Taylor's Elkhorn Evolution of a Kentucky Landscape. The lecture series also led to the establishment of the first historically zoned districts, which have inspired the long overdue revitalization of our historic buildings in downtown, South Frankfurt, and our crown jewel, the Corner and Celebrities. It led to the establishment of one of the first Main Street programs in the United States and the first in Kentucky. And thanks to people like the Sowers, Gippy Graham, the Bogarts, Jim Birch, Danny Garland, Charlie Jones, Crit Lou Allen, Martha Moore, Mary Smith, Louis Tandy, and Rob Moore, led to the founding of the Museum of the City of Frankfurt, which most of us know today as the Capital City Museum. And the late Rodney Ratliff graciously donated the current building to the city for the museum. Today, Frankfurt and Franklin County have nearly 1,200 individually or contributing historic buildings, structures, or archeological sites on the National Register of Historic Places. We're home to three national historic landmarks, including the Old State Capitol, Buffalo Trace Distillery, and Liberty Hall Historic Site are lucky to be home to the Schweitzer Covered Bridge, our state historic bridge, and collectively have over 70 Kentucky historical markers recognizing sites, events, and people considered important to local, regional, state, and national history. As you can see, telling Frankfurt's story leads to great, meaningful, and long-lasting results. Some of the most recent accomplishments are the hiring of Frankfurt's first historic preservation officer, the National Register nominations for the Old Buckram Baptist Church building by the Mullers, the compilation of the African American Historic Context Report, the preservation and future nominations of Green Hill Cemetery and Green Hill Missionary Baptist Church, the preservation of the First Corinthian Missionary Baptist Church's parsonage, the renovations of the Mason and Hogue building, the Marcus building, and the 1866 firehouse, and the recent renovations by the, of the Capital City Museum's main exhibit and the expansion of its program, uh, programming, and the recently announced 15% increase in tourism revenues to Franklin County, which is likely to continue due to these type of efforts. October 6 was not only the kickoff of Bourbon on the Banks, but it was also Frankfurt's 237th birthday. And July 16th was the 250th anniversary of the first survey of Frankfurt by surveyor Hancock Taylor for, the fellow, for fellow explorer Robert McAfee. 
This symbolic event not only marked the beginning of the settlement of Frankfurt and led to other important vit, uh, events, including the founding of Harrodsburg, but it also marked the transition toward the colonization of land inhabited by indigenous communities that lived in, Fra in the Frankfurt area for over 12,000 years, who not only had countless lives ended as a result of this transition, but also had their cultures and histories erased from the history books. As we march toward the commemorations of other 250th anniversaries, including the signing of the De Declaration of Independence, the founding of the city of Frankfurt, the establishment of Kentucky's statehood, and the formation of Franklin County, it is important that we tell a more inclusive story of our nation, state, and community. As a sign of this change, just this week, we celebrated Indigenous Peoples Day, which deservedly replaced for the former Columbus Day in order to tell and represent this more inclusive and accurate story of the United States, its many people, its diverse cultures, its diversity of ideas and thought, but also to remember that while we are a country founded by immigrants, that it came at the cost of many nations of Native Americans who called our continent home for over 26,000 years before us. Telling our story in these contexts with the inspiration of the past lecture series, but also including more abstract subjects such as art, poetry, music, and ideas, is among the goals of the Frankfurt Heritage Lecture Series, and I hope you will continue to join us as we embark on this effort. If you have subjects you'd like to see discussed, speaker recommendations, or if you'd like to engage in a research project yourself to present for a future lecture, please reach out to myself or Diane Dahoney. We'd love to hear from you. There are perhaps not many better subjects with which to begin our lecture series than with a story that is related to the Brown family, one of Frankfurt's first families whose influence spans local, state, and national governments over centuries, whose houses stand as national beacons of historic preservation by one of the premier and oldest ladies societies in the United States, the National Society of Colon Colonial Dames in the Commonwealth of Kentucky, a family who internally and publicly struggled with both the philosophies of enslavement and abolition, whose property sits on a Native American public archaeological site, and who continue to inspire scholarly research such as the new book, Kentucky's First Senator, The Life and Times of John Brown, as well as, the new, as new historic preservation efforts like the recent and ongoing restoration of the Cor Colonel Orlando Brown Summer Home in Thornhill. And I would be remiss if I didn't, didn't acknowledge the Colonial Dames and our speaker today on recently being awarded the 2023 Edith S. Bingham Excellence in Preservation Education Award by Preservation Kentucky, one of the state's most prestigious preservation awards given each year for preservation educators, projects or programs that demonstrate excellence in traditional or non-traditional educational arenas and innovative historic programming. Please stick around for the end where we will hold a brief Q&A from the audience and we'll be announcing December's speaker. Again, thank you for coming today. And without further ado, please welcome Diane Dahoney, Community Services Librarian for Paul Sawyer Public Library to pre present our first speaker. Thank you so much, John. Um, as he said, my name is Diane Dahoney. I'm the Community Service Librarian here at Paul Sawyer. On behalf of the library, I just wanna welcome everyone out today. I know that there is a lot going on in Frankfurt today, so it is not lost on me that you've chosen to spend part of your day with us, and we really appreciate that and your support in kicking off this new series. Um, it is my great honor to introduce our first Frankfurt Herit Heritage Lecture Series presenter. Executive Director of Liberty Hall Historic Site, Jessica Stavros, has been a museum professional and local historian for nearly 20 years. She received a bachelor's degree in history from the University of Louisville and a master's degree in business communication from Spalding University, both of which were fully funded by the Jack Kent Cooke Foundation in Washington, D.C. She is also a graduate of the History Liter Leadership Institute, class of 2016. Her passion lies in 19th century Ohio Valley, Valley history, and this focus brought her to work within historic house and community museums in the Louisville area. As the Southeast Regional Director for the Indiana State Museum and Historic Sites, she directed three historic sites located in southern Indiana. Culbertson Mansion in New Albany, Corden Capital in Corden, and Lanier Mansion in Madison. 
Most recently, she served as Deputy Director of the Kentucky Historical Society. Please help me to welcome to the podium, Jessica St Stavros. Your, bi like, your bio always makes you sound so important, especially when somebody else says it. I love it. But I just, I, I always still feel like I'm a 25-year-old student because I love learning so much. So it is a real honor to be here. I have to get myself set up. Am I loud enough for everyone? Have my remote control? Smile for the camera. Thank you for the lights. Thank you. OK. Um, I'm excited to present on the poet and the painter Robert Burns Wilson. Um, aside with, uh, from my personal connection to the organization, as I said, I'm forever a student and a lover of history. So to have the opportunity to be the inaugural speaker for the new Frankfurt Heritage Lecture Series, uh, it's, it's really quite special and it makes me, um, makes me feel honored. Thank you. So I appreciate you, John Carlton and Diane Dahoney. You are excellent community partners and I love it when we have lunch. Um, there's a small group of us here in the Frankfurt community who work together to kind of push the heritage of our capital city forward. And it's important to not only remind people of the incredible moments that make this place so special, but it's also about teaching a new generation about where they come from and how they are special because they are from here. And so this lecture series was an organic and collaborative idea to do just that. So again, I appreciate it. As mentioned, I am the executive director at Liberty Hall Historic Site, which is just a few short blocks from here. I did drive today, which felt ridiculous because I can see it from the corner, but I had someone's very special painting in my possession, so I didn't want to carry it down the street. Um, the site is owned by the National Society of the Colonial Dames of America in Kentucky, the Dames, as they are affectionately called. They became stewards of our history and served in the public trust in caring for the land, its two houses, and all the moments we might discover within that detail, a shared human experience of all who have come across that land. The mission of the Colonial Dames is centered around three things historic preservation, history education, and patriotic service. I have seen firsthand just how incredible their work is and their impact is all around the Commonwealth. So I will also, I don't believe I see any today, although there's Nell. Um, thank you to the Colonial Dames. Oh, there's Becky back there. Thank you for allowing me to speak on your behalf. And I encourage all of you to support their good work. And if uh, you would like to learn more about how you might support their work, just get connected with us at Liberty Hall. So I will humbly admit there are many people in this room that know a lot more about Robert Burns Wilson than I do. Um, I had never heard of Robert Burns Wilson before I came to Liberty Hall. Now I had heard about his famous poem, Remember the Maine, but only in the context of the Spanish-American War, which we'll talk about later. But the painter and the poet that made Frankfurt his home, I did not know him. The interpretation of this talk um, comes from a compilation of research done at Liberty, in the Liberty Hall files compiled by former employees, specifically Beth Caffrey Carter, Vicki Middlesworth, Sarah Elliott, and others. And I also had a very lively conference with uh, historian Estelle Pennington, who's written on Robert Burns Wilson, um, and he helped me sort out some of the conflicting details in the research. I did know a few of his pieces, however, particularly these that you see. These are two portraits that hang in the dining room of the Orlando Brown House. These are portraits of Mary Watts Brown on the left. She was 12 in this portrait, painted in 1880. And her sister, Annie Horde Brown on the right, who was 15 at the time this portrait was taken. Um, I, I love these portraits because these are in their dining room and Annie and Mary were the last to live in the Orlando Brown house. 
And in the front room that is now our museum store, they sat for formal portraits in their early 20s, and they are also in there. So it's really nice to see them as young girls, and then again as portraits as young adults. As you can see, the girls are in lovely dresses. They're walking along an idyllic Kentucky landscape. I see these portraits every day uh, on, as I walk through the dining room and go upstairs to my office. And the impression that they give me, especially when the lights are off, um, is that it's, it's very innocent. There's an innocence that comes through this artistic rendering and it's simplistic beauty. Even the foliage that might be um, dropped limbs and logs and who knows what kind of plants, all of it looks as if these girls have lived a life among the flowers. And the honest truth is that they truly did. Uh, I began working at Liberty Hall uh, last summer. I just had my first year there. And for those who have not visited the site, is there anyone in here that has not been to Liberty Hall? Okay, good, at least there's someone. Because now you're gonna wanna go. Um, Liberty Hall Historic Site is a nearly five acre plot on the banks of the Kentucky River with two historic houses, both of which belong to the Brown family. Liberty Hall on the left was built beginning 1796 and the Orlando Brown House on the right, 1835. John and Margareta Brown built Liberty Hall as um, John Carlton said, Mr. John Brown was the first senator and really the man responsible for uh, Kentucky statehood in 1792. He uh, and Margareta built the house and Margareta bore five children but only two of them, sons, Mason and Orlando, would live to see adulthood. As the eldest, Mason inherited Liberty Hall, where he and his family and their descendants lived from 1796 to 1937, when the last descendant, a woman named Mary Mason Scott, also known as Mame, uh, that's when she passed away and left the house to become a historic house museum. John and Margareta wanted their sons to have equal inheritance, so they commissioned famed Kentucky architect Gideon Shryock to build a home for Orlando, which is on the right, where he, his family, and their descendants lived from 1835 to 1955 when uh, Mary Watts Brown and Annie Horde Brown both died within the same year and left the house to become a historic house museum. I will say um, it's remarkable to have homes in families for this long and this family knew of their importance so they kept all their stuff. The furniture, much of the furniture is in the same place where it's been for centuries from pantry boxes and kitchen tools to clothes to beds, we have all their stuff still sitting in there, which is remarkable to have an original collection. Liberty Hall also has acres of a grand formal garden in the style, let's see, there we go. A grand formal garden that is in the style of a colonial agrarian Virginia planter. It's a smaller version of the gardens of John Brown's friends and colleagues who lived at places like Mount Vernon, Monticello, and Montpelier. Our garden began in the year 1800, and it has been continuously maintained for 223 years straight. The garden alone is one of the most remarkable things about the property. It was maintained first by the labor of enslaved African Americans, and then after emancipation, they were taken care of for decades by a man known as Uncle Isaac. And for the past 86 years, since 1937, the garden has been cared for by the colonial dames and a handful of curators, caretakers, and other stewards of this National Historic Landmark. Today, it is Frankfurt's largest public garden, and it is home to innumerable species, both flora and fauna. At some point between the two houses, there was another building, uh, the Chin Sutherland House, but it has since been demolished. These pictures were all uh, taken this year, since this spring. 
This is our um, catalpa tree blooming in the middle. In 1800, I'm going to see it right here. In 1800, John and Margaretta planted this. In 1900, their descendants took a cutting from the original catalpa and planted the second catalpa. And 100 years later, in the year 2000, their descendants came back and took another cutting and planted the third. So we have three brown family trees. Catalpas. Uh, Foxglove, which we sell in our Um, our incredible bald face wasp nest that went up overnight, it was over a foot tall, and you can see it is made of the foliage of the garden, fresh cut grass, leaves, and everything else. It was an incredible sculpture. And then everyone's favorite neighbor, Frank the rock snake, just gets longer and longer. Now, I set the stage for Liberty Hall because it was this very property where Robert Burns Wilson spent so much time. He was a very close friend to Mame, Liberty Hall's last brown inhabitant. One of Liberty Hall's most redeeming qualities is that it has been a center of Kentucky culture since the day it was built. From its distinctive architecture to the ori original collection within of decorative arts to the stories of the people who lived and worked on the property. Still today, people come and marvel at our site, and they are often inspired by its serenity and its beauty, especially in the garden. This is the kind of place that creates culture, and for Robert Burns Wilson, it was no different. He was uh, born in Pennsylvania in 1851, but at a young age went to live uh, in West Virginia with his grandparents. He was orphaned after the death of his parents, but he recalled later that his mother was a creative person. She would sing and draw and paint. And as he grew older, he taught himself to draw and paint. And by the age of 21, he decided he was going to move to Pittsburgh and become an artist. Now, I suppose artists were no different then as they are now and that they have a great need to express themselves. And uh, Robert was so expressive that he even joined the circus at one point. I do not know what his job was in the circus. Um, Estelle has some theories, but we'll just say he was an active service circus member. At this time in uh, Pittsburgh, he had a roommate named John Alexander, and the two were fast friends, and I guess the art business wasn't enough to sustain them because Robert and John decided to take the quintessential trip uh, down the Ohio River from Pittsburgh to Louisville in a boat complete with the Oregon Trail wagon cover topper on top of their boat. Now, when I imagine Robert Burns Wilson as a young man living in Pittsburgh in 1871, right at the beginning of Pittsburgh's golden age, the intense growth of the city was centered on the steel and coal industries. This would be an urban behemoth of gray steel and black soot and sounds I'm sure that probably never stopped. I don't imagine, these are city streets uh, in Pittsburgh in the 1870s and the, the river view. I don't imagine this is a very natural, serene, and beautifully inspiring environment. But neither was Louisville in 1871, and many river cities were still uh, rebuilding their lives after the Civil War, and immigration was growing. Cities like these, um, river cities with lots of immigration and lots of industry were just bursting at the seams. And there were social services for, were lacking for those that did not have the comforts of cash. Um, definitely water problems, cholera outbreaks, um, dirt, soot, disease, unsupervised children, all sorts, all sorts of things. So these are the, these cities are the setting where Robert Burns Wilson began his life as an artist. So he's in Louisville in 1871, and Robert is doing portraiture for local citizens. And he does this for a few years until one day he met two gentlemen from Frankfurt, one of whom is on the left, and his name is Sim Major, and that's him here, an imposing figure. 
And Major admired his work and convinced Robert, who was 25 years old at the time, to come to Frankfurt because there would be plenty of work for him there as an artist. Uh, and so Robert Burns Wilson agreed and followed. He moved to Frankfurt in 1875, and he spent just over 30 years here making his life here as a painter and a poet. Now in that time, the art business does very well for him. Uh, it is clear from his work, he was inspired by the natural beauty of Kentucky's gifts, the antithesis to his city life, and his art really begins to flourish. He became well known as a nature poet and for his paintings of Kentucky countrysides. This is also the same time that is the birth of Impressionism the, as an artistic movement, and his art certainly reflects the influences of this kind of style, with light and colors used, and nature as the primary source of inspiration. But Robert was a true artist, and he believed that poetry and art went hand in hand, and so he became prolific in both. Not only did he paint for himself, but he continued in portraiture for the good people of Kentucky, and he composed poems for himself, for his friends, and for the public. He began to publish in national platforms like Harper's Weekly, showcased his work at national exhibitions, and he experienced his first burst of international recognition in 1884 when a magazine called The Current published his poem, A Wild Violet, in November. Now violets come in April, so I love that there's a wild violet in Frankfurt in November. A stanza from the poem. Why am I grieved? What matter should it be that flowers must fade, that every joy should fly and all things change? Why am I pained to see that good can fail and gentle beauty die? One less violet on earth, what's that to me? Alas, I know not, no in truth, not I. This uh, is his portrait that was published in Harper's Weekly in May of 1887 with his signature below. Now at Liberty Hall, we have a beautiful collection of his work, including over a dozen watercolor paintings, one oil painting that is in desperate need of restoration. Um, I meant to, I would have brought it if it was not in such bad shape, but it's, it's on canvas on a, on a piece of wood and the oil has cracked and so the pieces are splitting. But this painting is black as night with just this bright white moon in the middle of it. And you can sort of see an outline of a ship. And there are not many paintings of black nights with white moons in his collection. So I, it is definitely one of my favorites. And um, we're going to raise some money for its restoration. But So we have the watercolors, the oil paintings, 10 original poems many of which are written directly to or for his close friend Mame. There are sets of sheet music and original copies of first edition books of his poetry in our library, all of which are signed and dedicated to Mame. The one in the middle on the top, Life and Love, there are, I believe, three poems in, in, that were published in the collection that he wrote to Mame, and it says, to MMS, that would be the title of the poem, to Mary Mason Scott. One of those poems uh, is on the left, top left. It is a sonnet that he wrote for her birthday. And then uh, down here in the bottom is a, um, Another, I think it's the last stanza of another poem he wrote for her, and then the bottom left is an inscription inside the Life and Love book. I couldn't fit, I thought about showing all the art slide by slide by slide, but we also have so many here to look at today. I thought, you all should just come to Liberty Hall to see the paintings. We have one that is like the Lion King, it is a massive lion on a bluff, and it looks, it's all orange and reds. It's really beautiful. But it's the poetry uh, that really gets me. Now, as he wrote these things for Mame, this is her in our garden with her mother, and then her on the left as a young lady, about the same time that she meets Robert Burns Wilson. 
Now, I don't know the nature of their relationship, other than, they, other than that they were close friends. But I do know that they spent a great deal of time together from the mid-1880s to 1901. I know the poems he wrote for her are mostly sonnets. They are very romantic in nature, and they are swirling with sweeping descriptions of the innate beauty of our land and its seasons. He was 20 years her senior, but he clearly held Mame in the highest regard and had a deep respect and admiration for her. I cannot help but imagine him in the same gardens we walk in every day and see him walking toward the riverbank and taking in the same sounds, birds, smells, or colors of the Brown's family, Brown family garden. I also imagine them sitting in the formal parlor of Liberty Hall as her with, as the lady of the house speaking to a fellow artist in the same exact room where the lady of the house uh, spoke to the Marquis de Lafayette. And I would imagine that that was not lost on Robert Burns Wilson either to be sitting in a place of where great people sat. I can also see him sitting under the catalpas with the stillness and the calm that so many people still experience today. So I have no doubt that he was also inspired by the grounds of Liberty Hall. And of course, we don't know for sure what inspired the man, but we do have the poems that he left behind. Here is uh, the last stanza from a poem from Mame that he called Woman, the Angel of the World. Whether it be today or yesterday or hence a thousand years, the dream of her has been and is and will be to the end, the one unshaken joy a man's soul can know. Wherever hence the soul of man shall fly, the dream of her, the heaven of her pure love shall be the soul's Elysium. She is all. She is man's life, his hope. She is the soul itself. I mean, I think he liked her. <laughs> I think he really, really liked her. If a man wrote me that poem in August of 1899, whew, it would be warm outside. So when he wrote this poem, he was 47 years old and Mame was 28. Um, now Mame had never married and she was drawn to spiritualism. Uh, she was well known for hosting seances and tarot card readings in Liberty Hall. Uh, Mame is owed a great deal of credit for helping seal the legend of the Grey Lady, who to her she called our beloved ghost. It was her old Aunt Varick, and she was um, one of the most outspoken of seeing her apparition when she was young in the 1880s. So Mame is very well educated, but clearly a free thinker. And, and she comes from a family of progressive thinkers that are tethered to the land around it. So I imagine that Mame and Robert and their friends are right in the middle of Kentucky's culture. These pieces here are in our collection. It is right at the same time that Robert is spending his days with Mame, painting landscapes and writing her beautiful sonnets, that he experienced his greatest national acclaim. Can you imagine just like hanging out at her house and writing things and all of a sudden he is one of the most famous people in the United States. In 1898, he wrote a poem called Remember the Maine, which was published by William Randolph Hearst in the New York Herald on April 17th 1898. The Maine was a U.S. Navy ship that mysteriously exploded and sank off the coast of Cuba in February of that year. And remember the Maine quickly reached the hearts and the minds of the American people once it was published. It did what we would call going viral. It became the rallying battle cry that incited the Spanish-American War, which was officially declared three days later after this poem was published. Remember the Maine became the official battle song of the United States, and when America won the war, the Spanish-American War, just 10 weeks later, it brought an end to four centuries of Spanish presence in the Americas, Asia, and the Pacific. 
Now I realize the conflict was set in motion far before this was published, but I cannot help but think that this is the power of poetry. We also have a handwritten copy. I re now remember I said that it was uh, published on April 17th, 1898. Our copy is handwritten dated March 14th, 1898, a month before it was published in the Herald. It's amazing to have this handwritten copy and it's just right down the street. So very quickly, Robert's fame grows from this. He thought he could capitalize off his fame and make a better fortune in New York. He made several trips up to the city in the following years, and on one of those trips in 1901, I realize I'm jumping ahead, but truly I don't know what happened, he met and quickly married a New York socialite named Anne Hendrick. The wedding was such a surprise to everyone that including her family, they were told of their marriage in the afternoon and the couple was wed by 7 p.m. They spent some time living with her parents in New York. You know, it appeared in all the papers, all the scandalous papers, how quickly they were read, wed. Um, but eventually, uh, Robert Burns Wilson does bring his wife Anne back to Frankfurt where they lived in a house on West 4th Street and their daughter Anne Elizabeth Wilson was born in that house. So she was born here in Frankfurt. But at some point they decided to make the move for good and relocated to New York. Um, Estel said that he really was banking on his success in New York, but he never reached the, the success there that he reached here. Um, and they lived in New York until Robert's death in 1916. And toward the end of his life, his family remarked that he longed for his days in Frankfurt and that in death he wanted to return to his Frankfurt home and he asked to be buried in the Frankfurt Cemetery where he rests today, overlooking the beloved city of Frankfurt. Many internet searches will remark on how close his grave is to that of Daniel Boone, but even closer to him is the final resting place of the Brown family of Liberty Hall. So when I think about uh, Robert Burns Wilson and his Frankfurt heritage, what Frankfurt meant to him, it's easy to imagine what might have influenced this artist in a way that he had to paint and he had to write I think about how he lost a mother who was creative. Um, I, th I think about his longing to get away from the coal hard steel of Pittsburgh and the dirt of Louisville. And I think about how Frankfurt was his family. And I think every single person in this room would feel that way. I don't live here and I feel that way. There is something very welcoming about this city. Um, and there's no doubt that he was influenced by the city of Frankfurt. He was a successful artist with progressive and sophisticated friends. We have the natural beauty and wonder that is the landscape of Kentucky. We have our limestone, we have our water, the birds, and the brilliance of our seasons, which he wrote about a lot. I would say of all the poems I've read of his, if they're not about Mame, it's about a season. Over a century later, we still read his poems, we get lost in his landscapes, and we have respect for an artist who felt deeply about this city and this state and all of the gifts Liberty, Gard Liberty Hall's gardens continue to bring. Um, that's the end of my talk, but I did want to share something. I brought something with us in, in Mame's room upstairs, which also just happens to be the same room old Aunt Varick died in. So it's called the Gray Lady Room, but it's really Mame's Room. Um, we have this book of Beethoven's sonatas. And so it has Mary Mason Scott on it, and it has you know, sheet music within. But one day I opened it up, and upside down, it's like somebody's writing in here. And it's just a scribble, doodling poem by Robert Burns Wilson. He practiced his signature. Um, it's upside down, it's kind of hard to read. I, I haven't yet transcribed it. But on the next page, <laughs> he's doodling. 
And it's called the lilies. And he's clearly looking at a table with a vase of lilies on it, I'm sure, that came out of the garden, and then writes a poem on May 15th, 1890, called The Lilies. And so, you know who this reminds me of? Richard Taylor. <laughs> Sitting there just doodling something beautiful and writing about it, doesn't it? Also with me, um, our dear friend Richard Taylor brought to Liberty Hall to allow me to share with you all today one of the original Robert Burns Wilson uh, paintings in his collection. And it is over on the table, along with other pieces brought by Judge Wingate and Sam Devine and Mike Mulligan. So we'll have to look at them. Some of them are, I mean, they're all really, really gorgeous. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll make sure to set this over on the table so um, you all can look at it. But, you know, light with the fingers. Be very careful. I do want to give you all an opportunity to ask questions, and I will answer them to the very best of my ability. Yes. It does, I looked in her um, journal. She kept scrapbooks for years. It, she did not mention anything about him marrying a woman named Anne Hendrick. But also, Mame never married and never had children, so I don't know if she really wa wanted to. I don't know, but I did look to see if she was mad about something. But I think he went to New York and then Unexpected things happen. That's my personal theory. You never know where life will take you. Um, it seemed kind of sudden. I remember the newspaper article where they interviewed the father, and he said, I woke up this morning and didn't know I was giving my daughter away. And so he was upset about the quickness of the union. Yes, ma'am. She was also young. Um, I think she was about. 26. She was, I think she was a little older than Mame at the time. But she was young. She was not 47. Are there any other questions? Yes. You can ask as many as you want. It's OK. I'm curious. Uh, I always heard about, I don't know how this falls in time with uh, uh, how Sawyer went, but there was always a Mame in his Now, I always thought that it was Mame Scott from Liberty Hall. And I had the impression that Mame, Paul, and Robert Burns Wilson were all very close. But, uh, you know, Frankfurt will tell you when you get something wrong. And they, I got it wrong. But I didn't know. There is another Mame, and her name is Mame Bull. And Mame is in the canoe, Mame Bull is in the canoe, and we don't know how close Paul Sawyer and Robert Burns Wilson were as friends, although there is no way they did not know each other because they were both artists in this city, painting very similar landscapes, both hanging out with women named Mame. They could have hated each other, or they were best friends. I truly don't know. I am not a Paul Sawyer expert, and I will certainly not pretend to be one in the Paul Sawyer Public Library. <laughs> we do have many of his pieces in our collection as well, though. We knew he also knew the Browns of Liberty Hall. He was most, um, he was closest with Horde Brown, who was the brother of um, Anne and Mary, the two girls. So we have photographs that were in Hord's collection of the two of them and Coney, Paul Sawyer and Hord Brown in Coney Island in like 1900. They're getting their picture taken in a little booth, which is pretty cute. They're actually on display right now at the Orlando Brown House. You can come anytime the front door is open, you can come in and look at our historic photography collection that's out in an exhibit right now. Um, so that was, we knew he was close to the Browns, but it, I don't know if the timing quite matches up. But yes, two mames, two brilliant artists, all in the same block. Mm -hmm. Good. I'm, glad, I'm glad you asked. The last time uh, I gave this talk in August, 
I had shared that I thought they were all friends and I was shown the light. <laughs> Any other questions? No? Okay. If you all would like to look at the paintings and then um, Tom and Sam and if you all want to kind of share, share anything about them, please feel free to stand by them. Richard, you too. Thank you all so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you all again for coming. And I just want to make sure that uh, everybody knows our next speaker series uh, will be December 9th. And uh, it will be uh, assistant. Inspector General of the CIA retired Howard W. Cox, who just completed a book on our founder, James Wilkinson, entitled American Traitor. Uh, General James Wilkinson's Betrayal of the Republic and Escape from Justice. So he's coming all the way from Washington, D.C., and the book is published by Georgetown University Press. And it is on sale at Poor Richard's Books. So. Uh, please go get a copy if you want to be prepared for the lecture on December 9th. Thank you all so much. Before you sneak out, um, back on the round table in the back there, uh, there are copies of a flyer, the flyer for December's talk. So feel free to grab one of those. Um, it has all the information, all the registration stuff on there. Grab one for a friend if you'd like. Um, those are back there and then also we have the library newsletter there's lots of history based programming coming up um, in the month of November especially so grab that if you're interested in some of the other things that we have going on thank you so much for being here have a great afternoon